the six to seven figure show episode 31 let's hit it broadcasting from the valley of the sun outside phoenix arizona this is the six to seven figure show tired of working so hard and having no time take your six figure practice and turn it to a thriving seven figure enterprise and now your host author speaker mentor and strategist Frank Bria. Everyone, welcome to the Six to Seven Figure Show. I'm your host, Frank Bria, and today I am joined by James Pelton, a good guy, good friend, and just good guy in general. Uh, he's, uh, James is a self taught entrepreneur and uh, founded Mobile Text Alerts back in 2011, uh, doubled its revenue every year. So, just a f- absolutely um, significant growth for a software company. A mobile text alert provides text messaging for thousands of churches, schools, businesses. And while he's not running the business, James is actually a college pastor, uh, husband and father of three kids. He and his wife, Alyssa, live in Lincoln, Nebraska. James, thanks for being with us. Really appreciate it. Hey, thanks, Frank, for having me. Yeah, uh, our pleasure. So uh, mobile text alerts, uh, I mean, this is one of those where areas where like you guys pick a name where it actually explains exactly what you guys are doing. No, no need to, to uh, have to decipher some strange uh, domain name you guys picked out. <laughs> that's exactly right. That's, what, that's why we did it is I had a different name before and people kept asking, what do you do? And I got tired of explaining it. So is, <laughs> that's the name mobile text alert. I always like to say it is way better to be clear than clever. <laughs> yes. so. Well, and as a computer guy, that's kind of how I roll is just – you know what? No, no cleverness. Let's just put it out there. Yeah. Cleverness overrated anyway. Yeah. So, uh, okay. Yeah. So how'd you get into this? So you're, uh, so how'd you, how'd you get into entrepreneurism? You're, you have both a background, a pastoral background, as well as a computer science background, which is, I'm yes. assuming not really common to have yeah. both of those things. <laughs> That's right. Uh, well, so I was working at church as a college pastor and we were actually looking for a way um, to let our students know like where we're going out to eat after youth group. And we were having a really hard time just getting the message to everybody. Uh, people would get left out and they'd be upset. I didn't know we were going to Wendy's after church. And so I was kind of just brainstorming like, hey, what would be a good way to get this out to everyone? And then I thought, well, if texting is how I would normally do it manually. So I'm like, so I should build something where you can, and I have kind of taught myself to program growing up just kind of on the side. And now I should just build something that lets our college group do this. Um, so I put that together just for our college group. And then I had, uh, I had about three or four churches ask about it. And then over the next couple months, word kind of spread. And I ended up with 90 churches <laughs> that contacted me saying, hey, can we get this also? Um, so I decided, well, maybe I should start charging for it and uh, kind of turn it into a business. So that's kind of how it was born and then just kind of expanded out from there. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, that is a classic example of, you know, uh, there's a problem, go fix the problem, as opposed to kind of trying to look for some amazing new thing. It's, it's, uh, it's funny how a lot of times we miss these really obvious things. I mean, I think a lot of people might have sort of said, oh, well, that doesn't sound like a particularly interesting area of focus, you know, just to get some churches. In fact, they may have even thought, churches won't pay for something like that, you know, but you, I mean, you know, when you go to your website and you look at the number of different verticals and industries you're working with, it's not just churches anymore. You're you're kind of everywhere now. Yeah. It it really took off. Um, And then I I, kind of just started seeing uh, how texting could help in all these different industries. Um, And then it's kind of just become more normal. You know, you go to Chipotle and it says, text this number to this word. So people know, Right. this idea of, of t- using texting for marketing. And um, so, yeah, it's really expanded from there. So and are you finding that the businesses you're working with are, um, that, that this is like a big jump in terms of effectiveness to leverage text versus sort of traditional email only or, or even compared to like Facebook Messenger, some of these instant messaging is text, is text that much better you're finding? Oh yeah. Yeah, it definitely is. That's probably the number one reason people come to us is their email marketing has really started to wane. It's not working as well anymore. Um, you know, we have people come to us and they're saying, yeah, I have, you know, 12% open rates on my emails. Right. 
Um, they have big lists, but just nobody opening their emails. Right. Um, and then we have a lot of people who come to us because they used to use Facebook. Facebook groups were a good way to um, get information out. But then just with the way Facebook has changed over the years, sure. you, know, you post to a group and you don't see it anymore. Um, whereas texting is a 99% open rate. Um, and 90% of that is within five minutes. Wow. So it's very, very powerful and very, very effective. And, uh, and it hasn't really changed in the last, you know, 15 years. Texts are just as effective now as they were 15 years ago. That's interesting. And I suspect there's also not, I mean, the thing with Facebook messaging is you've got this other organization with its own marketing, you know, uh, goals, I guess, that is going to interfere with yours. But I spe- in text messaging, you know, none of these phone companies really care very much about right. the messages are going across. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, and messenger messenger is a, is a good option compared to email. Um, you see, you know, maybe 70% open rates and messenger. Mm-hmm. Um, but like you said, you're still relying on Facebook to not change things. Right. Um, I kind of predict that fa- what happened to Facebook news feeds is going to happen to Facebook messenger where they, they, you see your messenger full of businesses, and Facebook's going to say, no, we don't want that anymore. And they're going to, you know, we, they've already made announcements uh, about the broadcast API that they're going to change some of that stuff. Wow. So, yeah, so, and, and, and anyone who's dealt with Facebook knows that trying to keep up with Facebook's thought process on how things work. Right. It's a full-time job in and of itself. Yeah. Um, I think the one question that a lot of people would have is, do, does, does texting feel intrusive from a marketing perspective? In other words, uh, you know, are, are people willing to give their phone number out to marketers like they would their email? I mean, people for a long time still even were saying, I don't want to give my email out because I don't want all the spam in my uh, inbox. But now it's going to be on their phone, which, you know, we all know is a lot more sort of an intimate thing for us. You know, we right. have this all the time. What are you finding in that area? Is that, is that a thing that people are willing to do a lot more frequently now? Yeah, you know, and it, it all comes down to you just uh, you just have to be you have to offer value. Um, you can't be what's happened with emails. People just send out so many emails, even that aren't valuable, that yeah. you know you just delete them without even thinking about it. Um, but if you use texting and you just make sure that you're offering value in everything you send, you don't send five a day, um, and every time you send, it's something that you know that the people you're sending to want to see. Uh, no. We found people don't really care at all. In fact, they, they like it. Uh, right. If it's information they're wanting, you know, they, they want to see that. Right. Um, people miss things in their email inbox that they want to see is, is part of the problem. Um, so it's just all about giving value um, as, as part of what you're sending and uh, yeah, not doing it willy-nilly. Don't send texts in the middle of the night, uh, some, some common sense things like that. Um, but it's just all about offering value. People yeah. want value. Well, and I guess it's related to your original use case. I mean, fundamentally, from a marketing perspective, you want to create the exact same kind of an infra- like feel, uh, experience that your church group wanted, that no one wanted to be left out on going to dinner. Right. So if you have that same feel in the messages that are being sent out, it's, it's got a very similar use case and people would want to have it. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and SMS marketing is almost, I don't really even like that term. Um, because yeah, if you use texting as just another marketing platform, well, yeah, people aren't going to want that. They're going to unsubscribe right away. But like you said, you use it, you're offering value. You're using it to, you know, develop intimacy, um, omnipresence, uh, then it's a really effective tool for that. Yeah. Well, and I think that's the meaning of the word alert, which is different, I think, than just random marketing messages. So yes, Absolutely. So, so let, can you walk us through a couple of case cases? So what, what are some of the use cases that a marketer might use um, uh, text alerts for that, you know, that, that today is not going very well for them where you're finding where the, the effectiveness goes up a great deal when you add texting into it? Yeah. Um, so the first example I, I'd look at is we have, a, we have a lot of tattoo parlors is a good example. And um, the people who subscribe to their list want a lot of tattoos, um, but they're always looking for deals. So they always want to know, Hey, when are, when is it going to be cheaper for me to get my next tattoo? Right. Um, so we have a tattoo shop that he sends out, a, you know, an alert, um, to his, to his list saying, Hey, I'm giving, you know, 10, 20% off tattoos today. 
And he's found that every time he sends out a text, he makes $250. So it costs him maybe $15 to send the text and he makes 250 every time he does it. Wow. Um, so it's just, it kind of has just become a money making machine for him. Right. Um, so that's been really effective. And then our, our most recent uh, use case that we're seeing really good results with is with webinars. Um, where people are having trouble getting people to show up at their webinars. They're registering, getting a lot of registrants, but then they're getting, you know, 15% that actually sh end up showing up or 20% right. that show up. And it's getting worse, I think. It is getting worse. As, yeah, as more webinars get out there, it gets worse and worse. Um, but we found if you just, it, we, if you put in texting, you text people to remind them about the webinar, you know, it goes to the forefront. You have a link in the text that they can just click and get right on the webinar. Um, we've seen people's rates shoot from 20% to 60%. Um, and just all they do differently is just send out these text notifications along with their webinar. So wow. super good results there. Yeah, that's great. Um, one of the things that I think um, any, anyone who's in the marketing space or entrepreneurial space at all that struggles with is um, integrating technology into their, into their processes. So every software company I feel like struggles with this. But one of the things I, I noticed about you guys is when uh, your onboarding process f feels very uh, specific to getting people up and running as quickly as possible. Not, not every software company is that way. A lot of times you sign up for a system or a service and they send you your login and it's like, maybe there's a link to some videos someplace, but that's kind of it. Right. You guys have done some work to make an onboarding process sort of uh, focused around customer success. Can you, can you talk folks through what you guys do on onboarding when someone signs up for the service that, that helps them get up and running with the, with what you guys offer? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, first off, I want to just say that this was a uh, painful learning experience coming up with the onboarding process we have. Um, we ran into um, you know, when we, when we first started, we, we had about 5% churn rate when we first started. And when you have 100 customers, 5% churn rate doesn't feel that bad. You know, we're losing, right. <laughs> losing five customers a month, but it's easy to get those back. Um, but then when we hit, you know, 10,000 customers, now we're losing 500 customers a month. Right. Start going into panic mode a little bit about how do we get these people to, to stick around a little better. And it all, it all does come down to just figuring out what the customer, when they sign up, what are they trying to accomplish? And then making sure that after they've used our product, they've accomplished what they set out to accomplish. Yeah. Um, so the way we kind of discovered this was I, I sent out a survey to all new customers saying, Hey, what are you trying to get out of this product? Um, and we had, you know, thousands of responses to that. And through that, you kind of figure out, um, you know, what it is that people are looking for. Yeah. And in our particular case, a lot of it was they were looking to integrate texting with things that they already had in place. So like, like webinar is a perfect example. People already have a webinar. They want to integrate texting with their webinar. And if you don't, you know, don't make it easy for them, they're going to just churn out. They're not going to stick around. Yeah. Um, so we, we have an advantage that I'm a programmer. Um, so I was able to you know, I can do the integrations, the coding side of things and make it real easy for the customers. Um, so that's kind of our goal is how, how can we quickly get our texting integrated in with their existing processes? And, uh, and then when that happens, when it's integrated in, then they, uh, they have a hard time leaving because it's integrated yeah. in and they like right. it, it's part of their daily process. Um, so that's really what we've kind of focused around. Yeah, that's nice. I mean, that's a, that's a, I think a, any platform software company that finds themselves getting embedded into the, into the regular system rather than just some sort of tool off to the side, right. they always have longer lifespans with, with uh, customers. Um, but it's fascinating because the metric that you're describing for success is the integration. So you guys are basically pushing towards integration, you don't feel like you've been successful until you've hit the integration point. And mm -hmm. I contrast that with a lot of software companies whose metrics are around users or even just, e even something less, um, I guess, organic as, you know, just churn rates and things like that, where it's still really not focused in on the end goal, the right. outcome of actually being integrated, because that's, that's the root cause of stickiness is is to have that integration point. So that's, yeah. really, 
Yeah, and that was an adjustment for us. We used to focus more on, you know, total total customer number sure. and things like yeah. that. But if you have, you know, a lot of people paying $20 a month, customer number doesn't matter as much as that lifetime value. I mean, that's where we're actually making some money is if we, somebody pays $20 a month for 10 years, uh, then they're actually valuable. Yeah. Um, so we kind of, we kind of switch that. We see total customers now as kind of more of a vanity metric. Um, where yeah, it used it to is. be the number one, the number one thing we focused on. Um, so yeah, that's been a big change for us. Yeah, that's a, and a great change. I, I, when I work with software companies, that's one of the things that I tell them first thing off is, you know, find the, find the right metric because you're probably not using the right metric right now. For yeah. Metric. Look, software is a tough business, man. So oh, yeah. uh, like uh, I'm, I, I know you and I have kind of talked about this uh, before and the fact that you've got all your hair still is uh, amazing. Uh, <laughs> but um, good genes. It's good genes. <laughs> and yeah, but I think also probably good decision making in the, <laughs> the actual business development piece. But um, for the, what would be your advice, though, for those folks who are thinking of heading off into this sort of SaaS or the software space uh, that you wish you had known early on when you got started? Um, yeah, the, the first thing is hire early. Um, <laughs> I, for a long time, I'm, I've just grown up being a cheap skate and just not wanting to spend money on anything. Um, this business has been completely bootstrapped and that's just how I, how I think, but, and that's good in a lot of ways, but it made me very slow to hire. Yeah. Um, so for a long time I was working a full-time job and doing sales and doing programming and doing customer support. Um, and when I hired my first customer support rep and just took that off, took that away, hired that out, um, the business skyrocketed the, the very month that I did that, yeah. you know, and it was a $40,000 a year investment. It wasn't that, that much that I was having to spend, right. but it was a game changer. Just, you know, giving me time to focus on growing the business rather than customer support tickets all day. Yeah. So that's now probably I, number one thing. Yeah. I, I, I think that's a, a great insight. I do think a lot, especially in software where you've got the tech person, cause you, uh, you know, you're, you're both, the business person and the technical founder. Like usually in a software company, you've got that pairing where you've got one person who's kind of focused on the business piece and one that's, you know, worrying about the technical architecture and the coding and the testing, but you're kind of all that wrapped up in one. Was that, if you had to do that over again, would you follow that same path or would you get someone to kind of uh, pair up with you, partner up with you to make that go faster? In retrospect, I'd probably partner up with somebody to do the sales side. I enjoy, my nature is more the technical side of things. Mm -hmm. um, and if we had had somebody who was more sales oriented, um, I, we would have grown faster uh, for sure. But it's, I, I've enjoyed kind of the learning process that I've gone through. And, you know, you can always look back and say, oh, I should have done this or should have done sure, that. Of course, right. Um, but I've really enjoyed the the path that I took and uh, I, I am getting the technology off my plate now. That's the thing I'm working on offloading right now. Um, but yeah, I, in retrospect, I probably would have partnered with a sales oriented yeah. person. Interesting. Well, I do, I do think it's an interesting insight for anyone to kind of look at where they're uh, I, won't, I don't want to say weaknesses, but blind spots or, yes. you know, not, not the stuff that you really want to do or you feel like you enjoy doing or maybe even should be doing. Maybe you're good at it, but you still don't, you shouldn't be doing it. And um, getting someone in as quickly as makes financial sense, obviously, uh, to go do that. But look, you can't argue with your guys' results. You guys are really successful. Um, whatever decision you've been making, uh, whatever the journey in the path, you guys have gotten there. So that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, uh, real quick, uh, last question is that I know that you're busy and, you know, we're, we're kind of running out of time, but I wanted to ask, um, as, as people are looking forward into sort of marketing, um, communication, um, uh, and, and building trust and, and credibility in an audience, you know, obviously you guys have an affinity for the, for texting and, and, and uh, communicating that way. What are some of the things that you see in the future that are going to change in that dynamic? Uh, do you think that people should kind of keep an eye out for? 
Um, I think email is going to continue to be less and less reliable. Uh, we've seen the trend of email open rates go down every year since 2014. Yeah. And it's going to just keep going down and down. Um, I think Messenger is going to – Facebook does not want people using Messenger for business unless they pay. They want, they want you to pay is what sure. they want. Right. <laughs> um, so that Messenger is going to not be as useful. And I think, I think texting is going to be – um, the go-to industry soon here. Um, texting is going to be the go-to that people are using. I um, see online people asking all the time, hey, what are you used for your SMS marketing? I think that's going to be big. And the challenge for me is going to be, well, how do you not make SMS turn into email or right. Facebook Messenger <laughs> and not ruin it? Um, so that's kind of one of my missions is to keep texting um, keep the spammers out of texting so that it remains a viable option going forward. Uh, it's, I kind of see that as one of my missions in the SMS industry. That, that is a really interesting um, insight and uh, the dynamic. It's, it's, an, it's a really, sort of from a technology perspective, it's a really unusual dynamic. I mean, texting as a technology has been around longer probably than some of these other uh, elements and is either making a resurgence or staying very relevant for a long period of time. And normally in a technology cycle, you would sort of assume something would drop off. I do think that you've hit the nail on the head though, about one of the reasons why that hasn't been the case. You know, most regulatory agencies have kept the spammers off of texting. Yeah. Uh, you're not allowed to do that. You can make robocalls, but texting is one of those things that is just sort of still a no, no. And, and there's discussion, at least in the United States, for those who are in the U.S. who are listening to this, discussion at governmental levels at the FEC or FCC about whether or not to open up texting to uh, businesses that don't have permission to send those text messages. And I think this is a big battle. I think it, it will uh, change the direction of how text messaging goes. So the fact that you're seeing as a personal mission to kind of <laughs> texting clean of that stuff, I, that's wise. And I hope it stays that way because we'd lo I'd love to have one channel that was sort of, um, I guess, clean of garbage and that you don't just start to ignore, you know? Yeah. Yep. Totally. To totally agree with that. And we're seeing it happen in Europe. Um, texting, text marketing is very difficult in Europe with GDPR and every, just everything that they've, Put together right um, so and you know and that's that's one reason that people uh come to mobile text alerts instead of just building their own sms platform is we've kind of navigated all the legislation we've navigated you know how to how to make this work in all the industries um marijuana industry you know it's becoming legal and they're wanting to use sms marketing and right. all this legislation going on there and that's kind of what we're here for is to help weed through that Hey, that's a good pun. We, we yeah, I was gonna say, <laughs> nice job. Yeah, that was well, well, well uh, articulated. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, it's right. It's true. So, I mean, fundamentally, this is an area where I do think people get nervous in, in the compliance piece that you guys have studied. You guys have looked at it, and you've got essentially a platform that's compliant. Yes. Yep. And, and we and we've studied that extensively. We've had our lawyers go over that extensively, um, and yeah, we try to keep keep our customers as safe as possible. Uh, we don't, we basically, we don't let you do anything that could get you into trouble. Okay. Um, we disallow it. Uh, so yeah. Good. Excellent. That's awesome stuff. Uh, James, I'm sorry. We don't have more time. Unfortunately uh, we're out of time and I'd love to chat with you some more about this, but I know you're a busy guy and you got stuff to do. Uh, you got a company to run and a whole team that's uh, buzzing around um, yeah. building up uh, more, uh, growth for, for you guys at Mobile Text Alert. So thanks so much for taking the time. Uh, for those people who are listening and want to connect with you guys uh, and are looking specifically at uh, text alerting as a, a way of increasing their marketing, what's a good way for them to kind of get kickstarted? Yeah. Uh, well, first, you, you can go to just our main website, which is mobile-text-alerts.com. Me and Frank were joking about, I don't, I'm not very clever with my names. I just said mobile text alerts. That's what it is. That's it, right. <laughs> uh, but we also, we're really excited. We just launched a new uh, product for webinar called webinar alerts. And basically the goal behind that is to increase show up rates at webinars. Uh, we talked with a lot of webinar people who um, were getting a lot of people to register, but not a lot of people to show up at their webinars. So we built a, a pretty unique product that is just, you include one JavaScript line on your webinar page and it hooks in a whole text notification system to wow. 
your webinar registrants. And we've seen show up rates go for people go, go from 20% to 60 or 70%. Um, and we, all they do is include that one line of code and you're, you're set up to go. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can go to webinaralerts.com and we have a special deal for this podcast, uh, $100 off our kind of starter package there. Um, so that's at webinaralerts.com slash six to seven figures. Um, but yeah, awesome. I'd love for people to connect. Yeah, that's, that's really generous of you. Thanks. And, and links below this video, if you're watching this on video, if you're on the show notes page and listening to audio, links here as well. If you're just listening to this audio uh, out and about, uh, come on over to the show notes page and we'll have that link for you as well. That's, uh, thanks, James. That's a really generous uh, offer for the audience. I appreciate that. Yeah, happy to help. And uh, thank you so much for being here, James. Um, it's, uh, it's been great chatting with you. Um, you. You really are building up an amazing uh, company and in the tech space, especially where there's marketing involved, um, there aren't a lot of good examples of tech companies that are sort of owning the customer experience the ways you guys are. So um, I really think it's like an example to a lot, of other, uh, a lot of other software companies. So good job. Awesome. Thank you so much, Frank. Hey, my pleasure. And thank you for being here on the Six to Seven Figure Show. I've been your host, Frank Bria. And uh, thanks so much for spending time with us. We know you got a lot of things you could be doing with your time. And if you're spending time with us, we're honored that you've invested with us to uh, help you make some progress in your business and uh, grow uh, your service company. Um, that uh, I really do recommend if, you, if you've got an opportunity to find ways to connect through uh, text alerting in your webinar, I mean, think about a show up rate increase uh, from 20 to 60. That's three times more people suddenly that you're talking to than you were otherwise on your webinar. So um, I highly recommend you check that out. So thanks for being with us and we'll uh, catch you on your next episode. All right, take care. Bye-bye.